and welcome to another episode of Project Supercar. Now that I've completed the lower part of the chassis, although I have to put the roll cage in to finish it, I could move on to designing the front suspension. Now this does include quite a lot of maths. I will be jacking up the car and taking off the front wheel shortly to give you a closer look at the front suspension, so I'd better lower the rear clamp. Ryan Little. <laughs> showed you how I used the old bulkhead or firewall from the old donor car to mock up the front of my chassis. Once I'd taken a whole load of measurements, I could weld together the framework of the front part of the chassis. Welding up the front end did involve turning the chassis onto its side. That way I could get the welder in underneath just so I could weld up areas I could normally reach. Once the framework was done, I could then carry on the design and fabrication of this front suspension. Now, although one of the ideas I wanted to achieve was to have a one donor car build, in other words, you buy one car, you get all the parts from it, I realised it couldn't really be done. And one of the problems I had was trying to use the original suspension from the Audi. I tell you what, I think what we'll do is we'll have a look at the donor car I've got in the carport, I'll show you what I mean and then we'll come back to this. The problem I had with using the front suspension from the donor car, which is an Audi A6, is this bit. The Audi's top part of the suspension is above the wheel. It's um, rather large, rather bulky. It's no good if you're trying to design a uh, low slung supercar because it's going to interfere with the line of the bonnet. One of the things you might notice is that the steering rack on this car is above the tyre and the wheel. This arm here connects to the steering rack. Now this proved beneficial for me because as I mentioned in the last episode, I had to cut out a few inches from the floor. I raised the floor up. Well, this has the effect of lowering the steering rack and column down, which means it was never gonna be able to be bolted back to the original location on the Audi A6. Let's pull the wheel off and have a closer look. With the wheel removed, we can have a closer look. As you can see, the steering rack is quite high up. You've got all this extra suspension stuff which would foul the bonnet on my supercar, so that was never gonna work. And then if we take a look at the hub carrier itself, and we'll find that it's all one piece. It's not really something you can cut apart. Well, I suppose you can, if that's what you want to do, but it's not really for the DIYer, and I was also trying to develop a kit, so I didn't want people having to chop into sort of uh, Audi A6 hubs to build my kit, so uh, this was never gonna work. And because the hub was no good, sadly this meant I don't think I could use these big brakes. 
So cutting and welding the hub carriers was off the table for me. But here's a chap who did it with some Mercedes hub carriers. This is the spindle from the 55, the one that I'm planning to use for this car, but in order to use it in that car, I'm gonna have to change the location of all these ball joints and basically do a lot of cutting and welding on this. And just to quickly explain how the geometry works on the E55, well, that is also a double wishbone suspension, so there's a, a top control arm that goes over here that pivots on this ball joint, and then there's a lower control arm. Well, the lower control arm is actually split into two in this car. It's something called a virtual pivot. So after this, I cut off the top mounting point of the ball joint for the upper control arm. Uh, this was because I was planning to reuse the same attachment point, but just relocate it to the place I needed to place it at. To make sure I positioned the mounting point for the ball joint at the correct position according to like um, where I wanted to place it at, I just used some more scrap metal and I clamped it to the wheel hub, and I also clamped that mounting point to this position and I made sure that the measurements were right. And once I had all the measurements figured and I knew everything was in the right place, I just figured out where I needed to cut this and uh, cut the spindle at in order to uh, weld these two things together. And then after that I did some more angle grinding and then cut the spindle off. And after that I applied the weld. It was initially a little difficult to get the weld started because I guess the metal was still a little cold. Here's a look at the spindles after everything is done. Um, after the welding I have given them a quick paint just to make sure that they don't start getting rusted over time. Of course, when you're designing your front suspension for your supercar, one of the issues is the height of the car. I mean, it's a low, slow, sleek car, so you tend to lose a lot of height under the bonnet. Even Koenigsegg had to make a compromise. Now at the front of the car, we can see we have a similarly complex uh, suspension layout. And actually here, everything is very, very low to have, again, as low center of gravity as possible, but also we needed to make it low to be able to get our roof into the car, which is a very unique feature. Uh, so we couldn't have anything in, in the way for the roof to slide it in here. Uh, but it had the side effect of, of actually also lowering the center of gravity. So that's a perfect example of two needs uh, working together without compromise. <laughs> Suspension setups that I took inspiration from was Lamborghini. Back on the assembly line, one of the door's most important pieces of kit is ready. This simple looking item is the suspension, but its apparent simplicity belies the creativity that goes into its engineering. The Aventador uses a pushrod suspension system direct from the world of Formula One race cars. It works by keeping wheel control and damper elements separate. By keeping the damper elements inboard, the pushrod system allows the wheels to maintain maximum contact with the road when going round bends, massively improving the handling on corners. A must for a car that can hit speeds of up to 350 kilometers per hour. Now, because I don't have the money that Lamborghini has, I really couldn't do a front suspension setup like one of their cars. So, my design is a little, little bit closest to, say, a Noble. Well, saying that, I don't even have Noble's money either. The Noble build-up is brought to you by 1G Racing, purveyors of the Noble M12 GTO in North America. Well, after the body is set down on the chassis and all the plumbing and all the electricals installed, it's time to put in the suspension. The suspension is fairly basic, but after driving this car, I'll tell you what, Lee Noble got it right on the M12. He hit the sweet spot. It really works. It's a tubular upper and lower A-arm. It's got a hub here that's actually machined right here on high-tech's premises in the CNC room. The rotor and the calipers and AP piece made especially for Noble. The hat is machined right here in the CNC shop as well making sure that it's duplicated every single time. The rack, it's a standard piece off the shelf. The ball joints are a standard piece off the shelf. The shocks, once they're installed, they're a Bilstein shock, fully adjustable with an H&R spring. Now let's go to the back suspension. The rear suspension really isn't that much different than the front. We're using a tubular A-arm upper and lower. Again, the hub's all machined here. The rotors and calipers, again, AP pieces. And keep in mind, it's got 13 and a half inch rear rotors as well as on the front. The only difference really to the rear suspension is this bar here, an adjusting bar for the toe for the rear. 
You gotta like how this guy thinks. He's got a tow hook, a factory tow hook on a street car. The other thing is what they're doing is when they're assembling, everything gets checked and double checked. They're using grade eight hardware, they're using nylock nuts. After everything's torqued, there's an inspection mark put on every nut and bolt. After looking at the suspension, you gotta understand this car is built like a race car and after driving it, you know it performs like one. So now we've taken a look at the Audi A6 standard suspension, I think it's time I pull the wheel off and we take a look at my solution. This car's sitting a little low, so I have to get a scissor jack under the jacking point here, get it up a little bit and then I can get one of my trolley jacks underneath. With the wheel removed, we can take a closer look at my suspension. Now, if you think back to the Audi A6, think about that uh, hub carrier and this huge, great big cast iron bit, and then you've got the, the suspension parts up here. You can sort of see why that was never gonna work on my application. So what we have here is a BMW E46 hub carrier, hub, brake disc, and brake caliper. This casting here is the hub carrier. It's called that because it carries the hub. The hub is on the inside of this brake disc which rotates and it rotates on a spindle which is in the center of some bearings inside the hub. Now this solved quite a lot of issues for me. One of the things you've got to get right with the steering and front suspension of any car is to get the Ackerman steering correct. Because the BMW E46 has a wheelbase very similar to my car, it's only slightly longer, and that I've pushed these hubs out just a little bit, the Ackerman steering actually worked out really well on mine. I'll just bring the camera in and take a closer look. So here we have the BMW E46 hub carrier. And this is where the steering arm is on the hub carrier and it's worked out perfectly. It's much lower down. This is the steering arm. We'll get to that shortly. This is a custom lower wishbone, which is adjustable. I've got a custom top hat insert where the original shock absorber used to go on the BMW. This can actually be rotated, I, I actually drilled the hole offset, so you can actually rotate this around and then that will actually be able to adjust the caster on the hub. The upper wishbone is also custom and it uses a upper ball joint from a TVR. This is a custom shock and what you might notice is the shock absorber is above the hub. Now this hub is designed to transfer the weight of the car through the top. So I wanted to continue that on. Also, it puts a great spot for the shock absorber so you can adjust it. Say if you're on a track day or something like that, you can open the front bonnet, get into the strut, adjust it, put the bonnet back down, and away you go. As I've mentioned before, the upper ball joint is from a TVR. The gas strut is custom, it is adjustable in height and also stiffness. This custom upper wishbone here is also adjustable here and here for camber. Both the upper and lower wishbone use TVR poly bushes from Super Pro. When you use rose joints on your suspension, don't use ones from the hardware store. They have to be automotive spec, very high strength. I think these have a shear force of something like 10 tons or something. Um, if I can find the spec, I'll put it up on the screen. But don't use normal off the shelf ones. They have to be automotive spec. The lower wishbone is supposed to be parallel to the ground at all times. Now, when you lower and raise the suspension on most cars, this angle will change. So what I was experimenting with is I put multiple 
bolt hole locations in these brackets. So if I wanted to slam this car down to the ground, I could move the location of the suspension so that the lower wishbone would always be parallel. This is the steering arm. Now we'll get to the steering rack shortly, but this steering arm has to be parallel with the lower wishbone when the ride height of this car is set. One of the problems of raising and lowering the ride height on any car is that on a standard steering rack, the steering arm can be turned up or down and this can induce bump steer. As I've mentioned before, one of the issues of lowering a car or even raising a car by too much will induce bump steer. So what's bump steer? Now take a look at this video. So bump steer is defined as toe change during wheel travel. So as you're driving down the road and hitting bumps, the, the wheels will toe in or out uh, based on the angle of your tie rod end. For our street kits, we use a, a tapered stud that slides right up into the factory spindle and bolts in place, and then your rod end bolts to this. So what, to adjust bump steer, we tune the, the spacers here, and it'll change the, the toe travel to get it where your toe stays even the whole way through wheel travel. So these are custom steering pins. They're made out of very high strength steel and can be adjusted. So you should be able to tune out any bump steer if you raise or lower the car. One of the good things from the Audi A6 donor car is that it had a center point steering rack. And what this means is that the steering rack arms come from the center of the rack and then travel all the way along out to the hub carrier. Now the good thing about a center point steering rack is that I can actually lift the point, the center point, up or down depending on the height of the car. So this ensures that the steering arm is always parallel to the lower wishbone when the car is travelling forward. While we're here, we can take a closer look at the front suspension. You may see this strut brace. I put this in to add even more strength to the front of this car. So you see the shock there, the strain if you like, or the g-force is then pushed through this strut brace to this shock. It's a very, very strong system. In the back of my mind, I'm always thinking that if I ever finish this car, I might be able to turn it into a kit that I might be able to, you know, put out there on the open market and see if any of you chaps want to build one. So with that in mind, I have to try and keep the cost down. So everything that I design has to be done so I can replicate it cheaply and easily. One of the things I decided to do was to make the wishbones on this car, the upper one and the lower one, they are the same for both sides. So the lower wishbone is the same as the one on the other side, same for the front. Now to make these wishbones, I had to use a jig. Let's take a quick look. Oh, well there it is. Now I know this jig doesn't make much sense to any of you watching, but the point I'm trying to make is you can't really make wishbones for your supercar on a bench. You really do need a jig. You have to get them absolutely accurate. They should also be made out of seamless steel and it's preferred to TIG weld the joints rather than MIG weld it. Well, it's been sitting in my attic for a few years so it's got a bit of surface rust on it. And it's quite weighty. So that was the jig for making both the upper and lower front wishbones. And I can see the Audi over there and I know I've got to push it back.
Now that I've got all that footage, I'm going to have to edit it together and make a video for you. But I thought I'll have a quick look at how DTube is doing. What? $17? Woohoo! Let's see how many likes I've got. What's that? 983 likes? Whoa! Well done, DTube! Over 900 likes on one video. That's pretty good going. I don't fully understand how DTube actually works, so if you're watching and you're on DTube, let me know. Um, I don't know what some of the icons do. But uh, anyway, um, I think I'll uh, wrap up now. This will do for an episode. Oh, before you go, there's a kit car show in Stoney at the beginning of May. So I've come up with a plan. Operation Break YouTube Algorithms is in full effect. I've had these leaflets made. You see that? There we go, there's the back, there's the front. I've got about 5,000 of these. So I'm going to be handing them out at the Stoney Show just to sort of spread awareness of my channel. So um, if you're going to come, if you live in the UK and you see me, um, say hello. We'll have a cup of coffee or something. Anyway, that'll do. Um, hopefully this uh, video's not too long and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.